everyone. It's good to see you here this morning. Good morning to you on uh, live stream. Um, it's nice to, well, we can't see you, but we're glad that you joined us this morning. Just before we get started with our service, we just want to go over some of the COVID-19 uh, uh, guidelines for, for Calvary that's been given to us by the government. And so one of the requirements for those that are in attendance is that face masks are required during the duration of the service. Um, there, in regards to hand washing, we ask that if you do have to use the restroom, that you would wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water for 20 seconds and then dry your hands thoroughly after that. Um, in regards to social distancing, uh, as you can see, the, the, the pews are marked out with uh, signs, but every other pew, um, families of the same household, you are permitted and allowed to sit together, and there should be a three-foot uh, gap between the next person or family group, okay? Um, in terms of the restroom, for those of you that are visiting, the restrooms are downstairs, and we would ask that when you exit, um, you go down the, there's some stairs that would be to well, my left, your right, you go down the stairs, and the women's bathroom is uh, right down the, 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 the bottom of the steps, and there's a bathroom monitor who will, you know, just give you directions in regards to that. Um, but one person at a time um, for our restrooms. In regards to tithes and offering, we would ask that you would use the envelopes and you would deposit your tithes and offerings in the congregation in touch box, which is just located outside the doors uh, on the wall as you exit the building. All right, and at the end, um, as we prepare to exit, we'll just ask you just to be seated and our ushers will take you through the exit process. All right, so that's all the announcements that I have. Again, it's good to see you here this morning live, and uh, we're going to start our service at this time. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. I will recount all of your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and exalt you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. We're here to worship our Lord this morning. Why don't you stand with us as we sing this? Upon that cross, in the 
going to sing that one right now. And I'll never know. And, and I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. And I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, and you're all together lovely, all together together wonderful to me so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God here I be seated as we're just going to open up our service and prayer this time. Father, indeed, we are here to worship you this morning. You know, Lord, sometimes it's easy for us to be, we, we worship everything else. We give priority to maybe it's a game we want to watch or an event that we want to go to. Maybe it's our job, maybe it's money, and we ask for your forgiveness. And as we're here this morning, gathered as a body, as a family, what an awesome opportunity and a privilege that we have to come before you as brothers and sisters in Christ to worship you, our almighty King. And so this morning, I pray, O oh God, that our hearts would be stirred towards you. I pray that your word would impact us and transform our lives. I pray that you would be the one who we long for, the one that we search for, the one that we live for. And we worship you this morning because you're worthy of it. We woke up this morning because of you. We have homes, we have food because of you. We have friends, we have relationships because of you. And if we paused, you know, so many other things that we enjoy, this creation, it all points back to you. And so we worship you this morning. Thank you for how you've provided for us, God. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for Christ. Thank you for the gospel, which is still transforming lives. And so, Lord, guide us in our service today. May you get the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You can clap for this one. We're a sea of voices. Here we go. We are a sea of voices. We are an ocean of your praise. Gathered under one name. We are a tide that's rising. And we cannot be contained. Gathered under one name. For a thousand tongues to sing the glories of our Lord, God Almighty, and oh, to sing the Savior's praise, a triumph of His grace. You are worthy, yes, you are worthy. God, let's sing it out a little bit. Here we go. We have found our anthem at the cross where sin was slain. Gathered under one name, where every chain is broken and every sorrow swept away. Gathered under one name, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. The Glories of our Lord, God Almighty, oh, to sing the Savior's praise, a triumph of His grace, you are worthy, yes, 
With all heaven sing and all earth below. With all heaven sing and all earth below. One holy king, one highest throne. With all heaven sing and all earth below. One holy king, one highest throne. Glories of our Lord, God Almighty, oh, to sing the Savior's praise, a triumph of His grace. You are worthy, yes, you are worthy, oh, for a thousand songs to sing the glories of our Lord, God Almighty. is worthy, isn't he?
to sing him in joy. Let's praise the Father. Praise the you to stand for this last one. We're going to praise him forever, forever, because he's worthy. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone who? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is anyone worthy? Is 
It's disease with sickness and, and sin and death and dying, but God, you are coming back. And you're going to take us to be with yourself someday, so I pray that we would be ready, that you would find faith when you return, and you would find us believing and find us faithful. Forgive us, Lord, when we have abandoned our faith. Forgive us when we have taken, uh, let something else come in and take over, but Lord, we want you. We want all of you. So will you minister to our hearts this morning through your word? Help us to understand. Help us to leave encouraged. But help us more than anything else to worship our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. And if you are comfortable uh, removing your mask, you may do so if you like. Uh, just be aware that uh, if you're going to go to the bathroom or anything like that, you need, you need that on. Uh, well, this morning we're going to continue in our series. Um, oh, oh, I forgot to mention this. Uh, uh, a big kudos and a, and a, a great hallelujah to the uh, Davis family. Uh, J- Dr. John and Audrey Davis were remarried, <laughs> if you will, 
on Friday, and they've got their lovely family with them, and so let's just give them a big hand for 10 years. All right. All right. Audrey, you have done well. You've been blessed. I, I, know, I know John, and so you have done well. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It's good to have you fellowshipping with us this morning. So we are continuing our series uh, on, the, uh, on Christology, and we're learning and studying about who Jesus is and his nature. We're, we've been studying, uh, we've looked at some things about the deity of Christ, and we've gone through a list of ideas that demonstrate that to us. And if you remember, uh, I, I drew a sort of a, a sort of a thick black line uh, on the on the screen, and we're not going to go to the uh, slides today. But on the screen, I had a thick black line, and above that line would be the transcendent God, where He dwelled, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Remember, and that He was wholly other and different from us, and that Jesus, being the Son, uh, was of the same nature as the Father and the Spirit, that they were one uh, in essence. And we talked about how at one point God moved through that barrier, if you will, and invaded time, space, and matter. And now on the planet, God is here in a very real way. We, we call this the eminence of God, his, his nearness. And he is so near us that we... Uh, we shared that, that song, uh, so near, so near, so very near, I could not nearer be, for in the person of the Son, I am as near as he. Remember that. And God is right here with us. Uh, we call him Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, nearness of God. And during this humiliation period, if you will, of Christ coming down and becoming a man. He was born uh, uh, through, to, to Mary, and he was born uh, to a virgin, and uh, it was just an incredible period of incarnation where, where God, being fully God, manifested himself in a man who was absolutely dependent on his mother. For some reason, we just use words and they don't shock us anymore. But that is shocking that the creator of the universe will be totally and absolutely dependent on a, another human being for his survival. That is incredible. That is a miracle. That is the, the, the mystery of God. And then in this process, not only, it's easy for us to assume or presume that, yes, I know Jesus is God. I can see that. It's clearly he is God. But the part that we struggle with mostly is, is, is kind of wrestling with, well, but how is he a man? And how is he a man like me? You know what you're a man like, right? You don't know? Let me. <laughs> okay. Um, I, was, I was watching... Um, Years ago, years ago, many years ago, Christopher Reeves, before he had his, broke his neck and he was the uh, Superman. Remember him being Superman? And Superman is kind of super, isn't he? You know, he can fly, he's got x-ray vision, he can, you know, he can, he's strong, nothing is, he, nothing can beat him. But on one occasion, I happened, I don't know if it was Superman 1, 2, whichever it was, he was holding something up like this. And underneath his armpits was sweat. Now, if he was Superman, <laughs> do you understand what I'm saying? Then he shouldn't have broken out in a sweat. We're going to see, though, today how the, the baptism of Jesus and the temptation of Jesus while they were real and significant and identified him as a man, he didn't break out in a sweat. He was completely and absolutely and resolutely God in the flesh. 
And so as we open our Bibles, you might want to begin looking at uh, Matthew chapter 3. We're going to turn there for a brief minute, and we'll go through a couple of ideas about his baptism. Now, the baptism and the temptation of Jesus are mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. The baptism can be hinted at in the Gospel of John in chapter 1. But basically, the first uh, three Gospels kind of address the, the, these uh, three uh, or two areas of Jesus, his baptism and his temptation. You will see the baptism of Jesus in chapter 3 of Matthew, and in chapter 4, you see the temptation. In Mark chapter 1, only three verses are given to both the baptism and the temptation. And over in Luke, you see chapter 4 uh, uh, giving to the temptation, and chapter 3 a little, uh, his baptism. So you'll see those ideas wrapped up there. But we're going to look at chapter 3 of Matthew for just a minute. And the question that I have is, did Jesus need to be baptized? And if he did, why? Do you understand that? If we, we have already identified the fact that he is God, right? And we're now talking about the humanity of Jesus, and we're uh, kind of expressing that out, and we're going to tease it out as we move forward. But uh, why would Jesus need to be baptized? I know why I need to be, and you need to be. Uh, we are baptized. This is expected for Christians, uh, for people to be baptized for at least three reasons. First of all, we get baptized to display our, uh, an inward reality that a change has happened. Christ has come to dwell in us by his grace and he's transformed us uh, into his sons. And we, uh, we are now sons and daughters of God by virtue of the fact that we've been transformed. And to be baptized is to, identif is to uh, uh, display that reality. The third idea is uh, one of identification. In other words, I identify with Christ that since Jesus is who he is, baptism uh, signifies being buried, uh, dying to my sin, being buried uh, under the water, and then rising up, resurrection, a new life. I'm identifying with Jesus. And then finally, uh, uh, baptism is, is just saying, I belong to him. That's what it says about you and me. But let's look at a couple of verses uh, in chapter 3. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to read the entire passage. I'll pick it up at verse 13. Verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. We just described that. Did you understand? I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? Do you hear John's confusion? Verse 15. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. What brilliant words. It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. All right, so John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, is there in the Jordan, baptizing people, and Jesus shows up. He comes up, and, and Jesus says, John, baptize me. And John is looking at him, saying, I, you're the one whose shoes I am unworthy to, to, to even handle, and you're asking me? I need to be baptized by you. And, and Jesus says, no, let's fulfill. It is a fitting thing. Let's fulfill all righteousness. I will be baptized to, uh, identify for a, a particular purpose. And there are a couple of reasons there. But just before we get to some of those reasons, is, is there anything in those a few verses that we read that's, that kind of shock you, stand out to you, and go, wow? I mean, there, there, there's, there's at least one idea for me. Uh, in verse 16, it says, and the heavens open. You, you, you see <laughs> 
You see how nothing really moves us anymore. We're just ordinarily like, ah, yeah, well, the heavens open. We wish the heavens would open because we want rain right now, right? Yeah. We say, heavens open, we need rain. Um, but the heavens opened. It was, it, I imagine it was a wonderful day. It was a brilliant day. And John is baptizing hundreds of people. And Jesus shows up to be baptized. And Jesus is baptized by John. And then when he comes up out of the water, the heavens open. Didn't, that, that wasn't the shocking part necessarily for me either. Um, I join you. Um, he saw the Spirit of God. Hello? Think about it now. John sees an invisible spirit. An unseen spirit. He sees it. Sh shocking. It's like, and then it says, and the spirit descended like a dove. It, just, it came upon him. Wow. What did it look like? Well, you know, yesterday, I enjoy looking at clouds. And I was watching the clouds. And I looked up at the sky. And there was this beautiful, massive white cloud. And it was moving very so slowly and peacefully through the sky. And as it moved, it left an impression on my mind. OK, maybe I was making it up, Bernadette. But it left an impression on my mind. The impression was simply this. It looked like a, an angel with its wings open, and it was just moving ever so gracefully and bowed its head like it was, and it was facing the sun, right? So it's like it was worshiping the sun. And it was so, so sweet. And I went, oh. Now, maybe it's because I was thinking of this passage that that was in my mind. I'm going to assume that that was what was going on, Tori, OK? But just to see that glorious cloud just descending and moving through the sky and looking like wings coming out and an angel bowing before God, I can only imagine John on this moment as he sees an invisible spirit descending upon Jesus. And as it comes upon him, it's, he says, it's, it's like a dove. And then this is the most shocking. Verse 17, and behold, a voice. Where would you go <laughs> if you, you know, the, the heavens open. OK, I can handle that. The spirit descends. I'm OK with that. It's like a dove. I get it. And then a voice. Where would you go? Come on, Please. people. You know, here's the point. God invaded humanity in the person of Jesus. And he came in the form of a man. And he comes. And now God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all show up. It's kind of like, remember the, three, the triangle that I had up top, which was dark blue overhead? It's like... The, the triangle now comes down through the veil, and it's in the earth, in the earth as sort of like a, a trans a water watermark on the back on the back side of your paper. You can see it, but you can't see it, right? It's there, but you, you, it's not really there. And it's this watermark that's there, and down comes the spirit, and and the the son is there, and the and and the father speaks. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Whoa! Come on, see? I, I, and I don't think John was the only one who heard it and saw it. I think the whole, the whole um, group that was there being baptized were going, what is this? Because you remember in, in Acts chapter 9, when, when uh, Paul was um, confronted and transformed by the Holy Spirit, it says in there, that all those who were traveling with Paul heard thunder. They thought, well, what's going on? Paul understood what the thunder was, but everybody else heard it. So I think they all, something's going on. What's, what, what is it? Who's it? That's what's happening. Why did Jesus get baptized? A couple of reasons, real quick. Number one, verses 1 through 12, so that he would identify with the message of John. John's message, verse 2, chapter 3, verse 2, was repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who is the kingdom? Not what is the kingdom. Who is the kingdom? It's not a trick question. Answer, Jesus. Jesus is the kingdom. And Jesus is here, and John is preaching a message of repentance to turn back to the kingdom, to come to the king, who is the king of the kingdom. Come back, and, and here he is. He shows up. Jesus is identifying with that very message. In fact, in verse 8, he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. He says it there again in verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, John says. But he is coming, one who's coming after me is mightier than I, I uh, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So Jesus was baptized to be identified with the, with the uh, message of John, one of repentance, turn back to the kingdom. He was baptized to launch his ministry. You begin to see uh, in other passages, particularly in uh, Luke, it says, and then Jesus went out and performed miracles. In John chapter 2, the first miracle he performed was the turning of water into wine at a wedding. Quite interesting. Jesus demonstrates his uh, uh, ministry, that he is initiated into ministry and service, uh, having already been baptized. So the purpose of his baptism was to identify him with the message, was to uh, initiate him into ministry. And thirdly, the purpose of his baptism was to authenticate or validate him as the son. Verse 17, this is is my son. And the, the overarching theme of his baptism is the work or power of the Spirit that comes upon you or over you or in you. The Gospel of Luke is Jesus' complete surrender to the Spirit. The Gospel of Luke teaches us how Jesus himself even though being God, was completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. And by the way, every Christian, every believer, is somebody who has to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. That the Spirit is the one who indwells you, the Spirit is the one who empowers you, the Spirit is the one who initiates you. It is all about what the Spirit is doing in you. It's the Holy Spirit's work. It's not yours. All right. So hold, that, hold on to that. That's one idea, that the purpose of his baptism was to uh, demonstrate his absolute uh, dependency on the Spirit of God. Let's hold on to that. Let's come over to the, the temptation of Jesus. Now, we could stay in te uh, chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, but I just, just because I want you to see it's other places, go over to chapter 4 of Luke, Luke chapter 4, and we're going to talk about this idea of the temptation of Jesus, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. <clears throat> now, uh, uh, let me just read there a couple of the verses, beginning at verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. So where did, where did the Holy Spirit kind of demonstrate he was being filled, came upon him at what, what stage, if you will? At his baptism. Now, we know that Jesus was always filled with the Spirit because Luke chapter 1 says that he was overshadowed by the Spirit in the womb all the way through, but in, in pictorial form, he, the Spirit comes upon him in chapter, uh, at his baptism, and over here in Luke chapter 4 now, we see being full of the Spirit, he returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. Oh my goodness. See, how many of you are running, run away from temptation? You say, I don't want to be, I hate to have temptation. The Spirit led Jesus into being tempted, led him out to the temptation spot. We'll get there in a second, but just let, let me just identify for you the, the, what this term means, tempted. It actually, the one word has a, has a twofold application, if you will. Uh, first of all, to be tempted or being tempted by the devil here it means to endeavor to uh, or attempt to cause someone to sin. So we know that Satan's purpose was to break Jesus down and cause him to sin. 
uh, to tempt him, to trap him, to lead him into temptation. But the other meaning of this word is to test. It also means to test. And uh, we, 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 uh, it's to try or to learn the nature of or the character of someone or something by submitting such to thorough and extensive testing. Uh, it's the, you know, you, you take a Formula One car out on the track and you put it through all its paces because you're testing it. You know the car works, you know it runs, but you're trying to test it to make sure it's running at its optimum. That's the idea. So firstly, Satan is the one who tempts us to sin. Okay? That's what was going on. James chapter 1, verse 3, the Bible says that God cannot be tempted, and God doesn't tempt anyone, and he doesn't cause anyone to sin. But James 1, 13, he's saying that God, uh, that, that God while he doesn't tempt us, uh, Hebrews chapter 2 says, but he does test us. He tests us. I'll come to some of that in just a second. Hebrews 2 and verse 18 and chapter 4 and verse 15, we understand that as Jesus was being tempted, and there are several ideas here, and I'll, I'll try to raise them real quickly, but as Jesus was being tempted, we understand that now, having been tempted, he is somebody that can sympathize or empathize with our feelings, with our infirmities. He can help us because he understands what your struggle is. Okay? As a man, as a human, he understands what your struggle is, the, the, the struggle with, with uh, I don't know, pornography. You say, well, Jesus understands that? Yes. You say, but how? Because he is, you see, because we, we, we say Jesus is God, how could he understand what I'm going through? But he is 100% man as well. He understands addiction? Yes. The struggle? Yes, he understands it. He's able to sympathize with it. The temptation of Jesus was a proving point uh, that he could resist temptation, and he demonstrated that by his reliance on the word. Notice, um, Satan came to him a couple of times. Verse 3, the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these, this stone to become bread. After 40 days, wouldn't you be hungry? He was hungry. Turn the stones into bread. Uh, because we already noted that Jesus could actually make the sons of Abraham out of stone. Because in chapter Matthew chapter 3, the, the, uh, I think verse 5 or so, he says, if, don't call yourselves children of Abraham, because if God wanted to, he could turn these stones into children of Abraham. So that's already been identified. So he says, hey, change these stones into bread. You can do that. You're, you're God. And Jesus responds, uh, it is written. It is written. Uh, again, uh, Jesus, Satan comes to him and says, uh, you know, bow down and worship me. And Jesus responds in verse 8, it is written. Uh, again, uh, he takes him up to a pinnacle, a temple, uh, shows him all the glories of all the kingdoms, and he, and he says, bow down and worship me, Satan says. And Jesus says, verse 10, it is written. During his baptism, he was filled with the Holy Spirit to allow him to do ministry. Now, Jesus has demonstrated for us his absolute and total dependence and reliance on what? The word of God. Satan is trying to persuade him to avoid the cross, but Jesus is going directly to the cross because the only way to have victory over this sin, this issue, is he had to go through the cross. Not only does Satan tempt Jesus, did Satan tempt Jesus, Jesus was also being tested by the Father. I just need to read Hebrews chapter 7 for you, so if you, if you want to flick there, you may. But Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26. Excuse me. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 26 says, For indeed, oh sorry, for it was indeed fitting that we should have we, we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, 
and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their wickedness as high priests, but the word of the oath which came later, then the law appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Jesus Christ, the perfect one, even as a man, offered himself up, and he did so once, so that we would be completely dependent on his work for our salvation. Notice that this whole idea, this passage, is really to prove or demonstrate or to confirm that the Christ, Jesus, the man, he's the one. He's the one. When God tests us, he doesn't try us or test us to fail us. He tries us or tests us to reveal to us that we will, that the victory is with him. He did it with Abraham in Hebrews 11, verse 17. Abraham was tested. In Job 1, verse 8, Job was tested. You remember Jesus, uh, God and Satan were having a conversation. Job, I find this very humorous. And, and then Job, Job, uh, Satan says, I've been going to, to and fro about the earth, looking to see whom I could you know, uh, devour. And, and, and God the Father says, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> Test him and see if he don't come up uh, following after me. And Job, as you know, did reveal his, uh, God's grace in that time, at that time. In Acts chapter 5, verse 41, the disciples were tested by the Father, and they finally said, oh, it was such a wonderful thing that God allowed us to suffer for Jesus' sake, and we have come out on the other side, and we're praising God. And the bottom line is James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 says, count it all joy when you enter various trials and testing. You will be tested by the Father. But it's not so that you could fail. It's to reveal to you the glory of God. Okay. Jesus was baptized, filled with the Spirit. Jesus was tempted, relied on the Word. What are the basic theological implications of all of this? There, there is, there's this huge theological word, impeccability. Kind of say that real, say it, guys. Impeccability. Say it. Impeccability. The impeccability of Jesus. What does that mean? It means that even during his life on earth, even while he went through what he went through on earth, he was, he was not able to sin. You go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What do you mean he was not able to sin? We do know that he was sinless, yes? that he died a sinless one. He took on himself our sin. He was sinless all the way through. So what do you mean he was not able to? If he were not able to sin, wouldn't that null and void the temptation because he then doesn't understand what I'm feeling? He had, shouldn't it be the peccability of Christ? Shouldn't it be that he was able not to sin? Like he could resist it? Sounds right, right? You know, it's, it, the reason it sounds right is because we, we think that the, to be tempted uh, means to have this pull so strong on your heart that you can't let it go. It's, you're going to you're gonna go after it. And, 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 once you, and, and once you pull back from it, you go, oh, whew, I was so tempted. Like it was that struggle, right? Picture it like this. The Bermuda Regiment, the Bermuda Regiment, you were a regiment guy. I was a regiment guy. You were a regiment guy. All right. Anybody else regiment people? Yeah, there you go, regiment people. The Bermuda Regiment had a total and absolute disdain for the U.S. military, Navy particularly, particularly, and said, you know what? That Navy, that Navy boat needs to go. It's violating our waters. So we hop in our Marine Division. We hop in our little marine divisions, and, and we go out because the United States, the United States has, has, has violated us. So we go out in our little marine and <laughs> jet ski, 
we got our mounted, our, our, our cannons mounted. And, and, and we, we, see, we see the ship there. And, and then we, and we start shooting at it. What, what, do you, what do you think the Navy's up there doing? <laughs> oh, my word, look at these people. They really are concerned, aren't they? Look at them. Now, let me ask you a different question. Was that a real attack? Were we really attacking them? I mean, this is, in, this is all fictitious and imaginary, but let's use your imagination. Were we really attacking the U.S. Navy? Yes. yes, we were. It was a real attack. Did it have any impact? No. Absolutely not. Jesus was really tempted, but it didn't have an impact because he is God, invincible. But was he tempted? Really, he was. And it's like saying, you know, our Marine Division can go up against a force like that, and we, we go, it's ridiculous. And so I take the very high view, and I, this, this we have to wrap it up. I take the high view that, that, uh, that Jesus is impeccable. He was not able to sin because he is God, but that he, he demonstrated to us as man how to live life on earth as a man by being filled with the Spirit, and relying on the word. Jesus did that for you and for me. Yes, it is possible for you to live a life that brings glory to Jesus, even in the darkness that's around you, because you are filled with the Spirit, and you are obeying the word, relying on it completely. That's what the purpose of his baptism and his temptation was for you and for me is so that we could see that it is possible. Now, here's the reality. It is possible, it was possible for Jesus in that uh, he was the Son of God and the Son of Man, and he was able to be baptized and filled with the Spirit and uh, avoid sin by relying on the Word of God, and he did so. Even though the temptations were real, it was just, uh, it was just like shooting you know, Nerf bullets in some respects. But Jesus... You, I'm sorry, you and me, our struggle is very real in that, oh man, am I filled with the Spirit this minute? Like, the, am I filled with the Spirit? How often do I need to be filled with the Spirit? All the time. i got to constantly be, 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 be being filled, Ephesians 5.18 says, which means that we have to confess our sin. We have to forsake our sin. We've got to do it regularly. And Lord, fill me, fill me, fill me. And then we take the Bible and we say, what is it you want me to do? And I see the scriptures, and this is what you want me to do. Help me to rely on your word to get over this struggle. Help me to rely on your word to, to, to trust you in the middle of the storm. We need to constantly be being filled, and we need to constantly be relying on the word. And that's why Jesus went through what he went through as a man, so that you could get it, and I could get it that the word of God is powerful and the spirit of God is powerful and it's all powerful. He, we can trust the Holy Spirit living in us and we can trust in the written word of God that it, is all, it will strengthen us and give us the resolve that we need when we need it. He's impeccable. And he's inviting you and me to trust him as a man. We're going to see next week the ministry, the message of Jesus is so overwhelmingly powerful. This kingdom, this gospel, is life transforming. And if you haven't experienced the life transforming power of God, you don't know what I'm talking about. But I'm going to tell you that he can change your life inside out in such a dynamic way and fill you with his Holy Spirit that he gives you the power to overcome. And when you read his word and when you trust his word, he will give you the power to overcome sin and temptation in the moment of it. But it's a day-by-day, moment-by-moment process. You're not Jesus and neither am I, and we will not be able to do it like he did it, but we can do it as he did it. So let me encourage you. Trust him. Rely on him. Be filled by the Spirit. 
and let Jesus begin to demonstrate his power through you. Father, thank you so much for your word and for this time that you've given us. We ask that you would help us to hold on to the concepts, the principles that are being shared because it's a lot. But help us to love you and to obey you and to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we stand and we'll close off with Is He Worthy? And they all say He is.
Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks for joining us today. The ushers are just going to dismiss you room by room, one at a time. Thank you for joining us on the live stream. We look forward to worshiping together again next week.